Yes. Uh, thank you all for coming today. Uh, my name is Myron Ebel. I work at CEI, and it's my privilege. Is this working? Yes. And it's my privilege to. It's my privilege to chair the Cooler Heads Coalition, uh, which is uh, was founded uh, over 20 years ago in early 1997. Uh, and uh, my colleague Marla Lewis, who's here, uh, the first chairman in inaugurated a series of briefings on the Hill. The first one, I believe, was in the Rayburn Building in 1998 uh, by Roger Pocklington, the late Roger Pocklington, a great sea level rise expert at uh, the Bermuda Research Station. Um, and we've had a number of distinguished people in the past, including Rupert Darwall, our speaker today, who was here several years ago to talk about his first book on the, the climate industrial complex, which was had the somewhat less provocative title, The Age of Global Warming and History. And it's an outstanding book. Uh, but I think the book he's not here to talk about today, Green Tyranny Exposing the Tal Totalitarian Roots of the Climate Industrial Complex, is even better. Uh, one, th one thing that makes it better for an American audience is it, it tells us a about a lot of things we don't know about in, in continental Europe. Uh, before I finish introducing Rupert, though, I want to thank uh, the House Science Committee for hosting us and for Joe Brzezowskis uh, for setting this up and for, for uh, his committee staffers who've helped uh, get the room ready, Chase and Daniel. Um, the, uh, this book, uh, Green Tyranny, Rupert says something at the beginning, he says, this is a book about freedom. Well, it's actually a book about the threats to freedom, uh, which uh, we are not, I think, fully aware of and which Rupert tries to bring out in his book. The, uh, the threats to freedom are ongoing, but something happened uh, during the course of, uh, when, while Rupert was writing the book uh, and it happened on June 1st uh, of this year uh, when President Trump announced that the United States would withdraw from the Paris Climate Treaty. This is not something that many people in Europe or Britain uh, contemplated ever happening, uh, and it's something that I think uh, Rupert can tell us they're not really accepting or believing of yet. Uh, he just returned from Bonn, COP23, uh, the, the 23rd Conference of the Parties to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. Uh, he was a CEI NGO delegate, and he's done that in the past. Uh, I wasn't there this year. Uh, Marla wasn't there. Nobody from CEI was there, so, so Rupert was carrying the flag. So uh, Rupert is uh, uh, a very accomplished uh, in financial analyses and in journalism. He's a graduate of Cambridge University. Uh, and he has been now working in this, uh, the climate bubble for how long now? 10 years? Two, yeah, ten. Too, too long, 10 years probably. Some of us in the room have been working on it since, at least since Kyoto in 97, and a couple of us have been working on it since 92, the Rio Earth Summit. So uh, with that, I would just like to uh, ask you to join me in welcoming uh, Rupert. Uh, copies of the book are available, and uh, after he gives his talk and we have a few questions, he will be happy to sign your copy if you would like that. So uh, please uh, join me in welcoming Rupert Darwall. Uh, thanks, Byron. I was, I was here actually, um, I was in, in Washington a year ago, and so much has changed in a year. I mean, the, the, the change, and, and nowhere has the change been more profound, more consequential, more, more important than in climate energy. And what Myron said about President Trump's decision to withdraw from Paris. It is of enormous importance. Um, he, President Trump's actually the third uh, Republican to have, have canned a treaty with, or rejected, uh, timetable, targets and timetables in, in, in a treaty. The first Bush did it with the original convention. 
then his son did that with uh, Kyoto. But this one is much the most important, and that's because the whole architecture of the Paris Agreement was set around, designed around the needs of the Obama administration to avoid sending a climate treaty to the Senate for its advice consent. So this was a cruel rejection um, by President Trump. And it happened because of the work Umaran and the Cooler Heads Coalition have done. So the United States uh, and the rest of the world owes an enormous debt to, the, to Umaran and to the Cooler Heads Coalition. It meant that you, you showed why this was such an important issue. This wasn't an issue you could, you could just go with the flow on. It is an existential uh, issue for the United States for reasons that I will explain. Because ultimately, this is, a, this is a battle between the administrative state on the one hand and America's constitutional order on the other. It's about how America is governed. It is, in a word, about freedom. First of all, I'd like to talk about how we got here, because the age of global warming wasn't going to be about wind and solar. Originally, it was going to be about nuclear. If you look at the uh, Toronto Climate Conference 1988, which was the first, it wasn't a UN conference, but it was the first one on climate. Uh, it was an informal one. It was hosted by the, the prime ministers of uh, Norway and Canada. Uh, wind and solar aren't mentioned in the conference document. It was about nuclear. And indeed, nuclear was the reason that uh, global warming as a political project uh, was put on the international agenda in the, the first place. I know that many Americans tend to... Maren mentioned that this is a book that tells a story that many Americans are not aware of. And one of those is that global warming as a political project started way before... James Hansen came to the Senate Environment Committee and said that global warming is happening. That was in June 1988. In fact, global warming for the Swedes as a political uh, issue had started a decade and a half before. In 1974, the Swedish Prime Minister Olaf Palme uh, said that global warming, climate change, would be the big issue at the end of the 20th, 20th century. That was when Al Gore was still at law school. So Al Gore might have invented the internet, but he didn't invent global warming. And it's about why Sweden? What is it about Sweden? Well, of course, the progressive left in this country want America to become like Sweden, because Sweden, it, Sweden has a welfare state. It has, it has pioneered and done more social engineering than any Western country. It's had the longest period of one-party rule of any Western country. And there's a lot of... Sweden in this book. Uh, there's a very interesting book written by um, a left of centre journalist called Roland Huntford uh, from 1971 on Sweden. It's called The New Totalitarians. And that book argued that Sweden was pioneering a new kind of soft totalitarianism. And Sweden had the bureaucratic apparatus to bring that about. Two centuries before Napoleon did it, and three centuries before Barack Obama pioneered it, America, sorry, Sweden already had a centralised administrative apparatus. And Huntford uh, writes in this that this apparatus was, quote, adapted to the swift enactment of the intentions of the central bureaucracy. The legislature is weak the executive strong, and for centuries, real power has lain in the government administrative machine. Well, does that sound familiar? Well, that is Barack Obama's view, vision of the way the American government, uh, Americans should be governed. So you have in Sweden um, the instruments, the bureaucratic instruments, to carry out the West's most extensive experiment in social engineering pioneering grave to, cradle to grave welfare state, and indeed really unpleasant things, more unpleasant things such as a eugenics program. Sweden had the first state-sponsored uh, eugenics institute, which was, which was set up in the early 1920s. And what's interesting is, as this country went into the, uh, into the 60s and 70s with student protests, uh, 
around the Western world. The Swedes were different. They realized that to, to deal with student protests, they had, to, they had to be part of the student protest movement. So they whipped up anti-Americanism as an act of state policy. Swedish television would show anti-American uh, TV shows, some, would do, some of them from Cuba, no less. And they, so they used anti-Americanism as a, as, a, as a safety valve. And their foreign, po in foreign policy, Sweden aligned itself with the Viet Cong, with the Khmer Rouge, and with Fidel Castro. But this is a very different country from what, what, you, what you see on the outside. Because Sweden, as we know, has been neutral since the Napoleonic Wars. Yet during the whole of the Cold War, it had a secret military alliance with Washington. Olaf Palmer, this great who made speeches attacking the United States in the most vitriolic terms over the Vietnam War, was aligned with the pro-CIA wing of the Swedish intelligence services. His, his first job was actually as an intelligence uh, officer. So Sweden is not what it appears. So when Sweden launched the war on coal in the light, late 1960s, which, which it did with the acid rain scare, what was it up to? I think it would be naive to assume that they were actually concerned, the real concern was with, with acid rain and then later with, with global warming. Because deep deception was second nature to this most extraordinary, uh, talented and deceptive of politicians. And in the newspaper interview where Palmer first talked about global warming, he, he described utopia as having the same function as a mirage in the desert. Without the mirage, he said, you wouldn't get to the next oasis. So just think about that. Think of global warming actually as a mirage to get society to the next oasis. And what was the, society, what was the oasis he wanted? Well, the short-term one, the, the, the goal he wanted was to persuade Sweden that it needed the world's largest per capita nuclear power program. So they launched the war on coal really as a way to bring about, uh, bring about nuclear power. And they said to the Swedes, well, if you don't have nuclear, you're going to have coal. And coal will result in your forest dying and our lakes filling up with sulfuric acid. And after, after they did the acid rain, they then did global warming. And what's really interesting in researching this book, you find the same cast of characters involved in both. So many of you know that Bert Berlin was the first chair of the Intergovernmental Panel, of Panel on Climate Change, but Berlin wrote the first governmental report anywhere in the world on acid rain. And reading that report, chain, should take out acid rain, put in global warming, this could have been a report, you could have been reading a report from the IPCC. The language, the way, it, 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 the sort of slippery way that uh, scientific uncertainties are elided into certainties, all that was there in that acid rain report. And Berlin, Bert Berlin was also, he was, he more than any individual was present at the creation of the IPCC. It was an organization he thought was needed. He saw it as a forum in which scientists and politicians could meet together and decide what was policy relevant in terms of dealing with global warming. And the giveaway in the project are the two conferences that were held shortly before the IPCC was formed. There was one in Vilak in Austria and another meeting in Bellagio in the Italian lakes. And there it's quite clear that this was a political project and that climate catastrophism was worked into the DNA, was in the DNA right from the word go. Because in order, what they knew was that in order to get the policy response that they wanted, which was deep, cuts in carbon dioxide emissions, you had to have, you had to say there's going to be a climate catastrophe. The discount rates didn't pick up enough costs from gentle climate change, so you had to assume that there would be a sudden uh, tipping point, at which point the climate would change irreversibly, and therefore that would justify very expensive decarbonisation um, policies. Now, in my first book, I touched on... Uh, I looked at uh, the, the economics and so forth of, of uh, climate change. But what, what's interesting is the policy response. Initially, as I said, that this was about nuclear. It was going to be, it was going to be a world of nuclear power that uh, fossil fuel would be gradually phased out and we'd have lots of nuclear power. Why isn't it? Why isn't it today the policy response? And that is because of the second country, 
that I deal with in the book, Sweden being the first. The second one is Germany. And it happens to be a historical fact that the German Nazis were the first political party anywhere in the world to champion, to have a wind power program, which they had for the 1933 Reichstag elections, if one's into election histories. And just weeks after attacking the Soviet Union, uh, Hitler was telling his dinner companions that wind power was the future. Now, that, all that changed, the sort of really... The, the environmentalism, the e ecological movements that you got in that darkest chapter of European history, that, that, was, that chapter was closed in 1945 with the end of the Nazi regime and with the establishment of a Western-style democracy in, in West Germany. And for the first decades after the Second World War, West Germany was a model Western democracy. It embraced the American way of life. But that began to change in the late 60s and 1970s. And that was because of, of what many of us know as the Frankfurt School, these extreme Marxist, post-Marxist intellectuals who synthesized classical Marxism with, with, with psychoanalysis and with Sigmund Freud. And they radicalized a generation of, of German youth to a far greater degree than, than happened in any other country. So in a 1969 poll of, 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 of German high school students and university students, 30% of them in 1969 said they agreed with Marxism or communism, a much higher proportion than any other country. Uh, Germany, West Germany was affected. There was a great deal of student unrest. There were protests against the Vietnam War. And in June 1967, a student de demonstrator was shot and killed in West Berlin. According to the New York Times, four decades later, that was the shot that put conservative uh, West Germany into what they praise as the progressive country it is today. What's particularly interesting is that the shot, that shot was fired by that, that West Berlin policeman who fired that shot was in fact a Stasi agent. He was an agent of uh, the East German communist regime. Now, in the 1970s, many of us have kind of forgotten this. Those student radicals, some of them turned to terrorism. You had, the, you had a wave of uh, German military bases, sorry, American military bases in Germany uh, were subject to terrorist attacks. There were widespread kidnappings. There was a hijacking of a Lufthansa jet uh, in which the Jewish passengers were separated from the Gentiles. And it was a very, very nasty decade in Germany. And these far leftists, uh, as I say, they, a bunch of them uh, became terrorists. And it, it culminated in what the Germans called the, the, the German autumn of 1977, with the hijacking, with the kidnapping of the head of the West German Employers Asso uh, Association and the ringleaders of the Baader-Meinhof gang uh, committing suicide in jail. And that the ordinary... Uh, Germans were completely repulsed by this violence, and the extreme far leftist student radicals were just left, they were just left on the margins of, of West German society. But they found a way back, and their route back were the widespread anti nuclear protests that swept Germany in the 1970s. And in January 1980, the Green Party was founded, and it combined old Nazis, neo Nazis, that old, that ecological politic that you found from the, the years of the Third Reich with the leadership taken from the far left radicals. And so if you like, what you had was you had red and green mixing to turning to brown. The, in essence, you had the, the, the new left adopting those Nazi, the, the, the ecological positions that had been previously championed by the National Socialists. So it's people like Joschka Fischer and Danny Cohn-Bendit, Danny the Red, were, in, were the, the new leadership cadre of the, of the Greens. And very, very quickly, the Green movement became part of the wider peace movement. And if you remember in the 1980s, the peace movement, which 
came as a, a response to NATO's decision to, to deploy cruise and Pershing missiles. It swept G Germany. It was heavily penetrated by Eastern Bloc intelligence services. It, uh, they financed a lot of the activity, and the local communist parties controlled a lot of the activities. And what... what um, what, what, to what extent did the, the new left have to go through any convolutions to, if you like, to turn out to be, to lead these from go from red to green? Well, it was just in a change of colour. As Paul per Berman, the New York uh, liberal intellectual, brilliantly put it in uh, his, his 2001 essay, The Passion of Joschka Fischer, all they did was take the left-wing Marxist concepts of the past and dress them up in ecological garb. So instead of Marx's catastrophic vision of capitalism, an eco-catastrophe. Instead of the socialist utopia, a new ecological one. Instead of the cult of the factory, the cult of the forest. Instead of the colour red, the colour green. And in this way, Berman says, to have set out to fight Nazism in, a, in its sundry modern forms only to have ended up in a modern left-wing guise, Nazi-like. And that is why it is fair to say, it's an accurate description to say, the, the modern Greens in Germany actually inhabited the same space as the National Socialists did in the 1930s. Where I... What, I think what's a very depressing uh, conclusion for us on... Uh, on the right side of politics is that how these people who were on the wrong side of the Cold War, they were in the peace movement, they wanted um, a middle way between the two blocks, uh, not, to, not to the east, not to the west, loyal to ourselves, they said. These people who were on the wrong side of the Cold War in the Cold War era ended out, ended on top. They were the victors in the post-Cold War era. And you can see that that, that happening quite quickly in Germany. So the Greens were formed in, 90, in, in 1980. Uh, by 1997, there were nine state, uh, states in, in Germany which had red-green coalitions. And in 1988, the first red-green coalition uh, was formed at federal level in Berlin. Two years after that government was formed, the German parliament passed the Renewable Energy Act. And the really malign thing about that piece of legislation is that it gave the highest feed-in tariffs to the least efficient technology. So solar was massively over-rewarded, and as a result, uh, cloudy, sunny Germany now has the more solar PV capacity than any country in the world. And like with the uh, Affordable Health Care Act in this country, the... MPs who vote on, voted on that renewable energy law didn't have a clue what was in, in the legisl legislation. No party actually campaigned on it. It was almost like a, a, a green energy pooch that happened within... It was four or five Bundestag members and some green bureaucrats in, in, uh, who were given plum jobs in the bureaucracy who pushed this law through with disastrous consequences. And where Germany led, the rest of Europe followed. So in 2007, Angela Merkel persuaded the rest of the European Union to essentially adopt Germany's insane energy policies with the new Renewable Energy Directive. So as I put it in the book, the greening of Europe was the price that Europe paid, uh, the, the, the price that the West paid for winning the Cold War. Energy vendor, a word you might have heard quite a lot of, energy transformation, is a word that Germans use to describe uh, their energy road to ruin. A more accurate term would be, the en would be energy deformation, because this is the opposite to what uh, Joseph Schumpeter called creative destruc destruction, what he said was the essential fact about capitalism. Rather, it is an example of destructive destruction at the hands of the state through covert, overt, uh, subsidies and through regulations. As you read the book, you'll find quite a few pages, I've devoted quite a few pages to analysing the economics of, of uh, renewable power, quite why it's so destructive. I pull apart the Clean Power Plan and the Obama administration's highly deceptive um, 
analysis, justification for the economics of the clean power plan. But I think there's a bigger and simpler point that can be made, that when you put green ideology and environmentalists in charge of energy policy, the outcome is certain, and that is there will be one massive car crash. To give you an example, in 2004, the Greens energy minister and former communist, incidentally, Jürgen Tritton, said the energy vendor would cost Germans uh, the equivalent of a scoop of ice cream on their monthly utility bills. Nine years later, his, his Christian Democrat uh, successor reckoned the cost would be more than up to 1 trillion euros, 1.2 trillion dollars. That is some ice cream. So what I, what I think this shows is that systematic deceit is not a bug in the climate industrial complex's propaganda. It is a feature. And I quote a, a highly revealing speech made in 1986 by a top German bureaucrat on how the environmentalists should forward their uh, agenda. And he was disarmingly candid about the use of what he called empty phrases. Ecological equilibrium was an example. A phrase he said quite rightly is completely meaningless. And another was the claim that the ecology, that the environment and the economy were not in conflict. I myself have made this claim, knowing it to be less than truthful. So whenever you hear about green growth, clean tech jobs bonanzas, just remember that. This means less growth, less prosperity. That these policies are in conflict with growth. And as a total, as a contrast to uh, all this deceit, uh, I'd like to mention the co-dedicatee of the book because he, he, he'll be known to many of you, Fred Singer, who's been a stalwart in the, in the climate wars and before that uh, was in the, uh, during the Reagan years, was on a panel put together by the Reagan White House which looked at the science of, the, uh, of acid rain. And incidentally, that is one of the biggest scientific scandals out there, that just as the scientific underpinnings of uh, the acid rain scare were, were being demolished, uh, the uh, Bush EPA uh, suppressed the report, the NAPAP report that showed that, the Clean Air Act amendments were pushed through the Congress, and the scientist Edward Krug, who, who did more than anyone else to show that the science was completely wrong, uh, he was demonised, his reputation was blackened, um, and really his reputation uh, never recovered, even though, or particularly because, he was completely right. Um, Fred, also had a, Fred Singer also had a leading role in unmasking the nuclear winter scare, also in the 1980s, and all but two prominent si climate scientists, I've counted them up, were on were, were peddling the nuclear winter scare, which, as I show in the book, had actually been planted by the KGB. It was a Russian uh, disinformation campaign to frighten the West into uh, so that uh, the, West, the West wouldn't deploy cruise and Pershing miss missiles. And this is a further example of where the people who were on the wrong side of the Cold War and got the Cold War grievously wrong, those scientists are the ones that governments around the world now defer to and listen to and say, what should we do about climate change? Anyhow, I'd like to quote in closing, to me, what is a priceless exchange involving Fred. It was, um, you may remember, before the first Gulf War, that uh, Carl Sagan predicted that there would be so much smoke from blowing up, from burning oil fields in, the, in Iraq, from Saddam Hussein's Iraq, uh, from set, Saddam Hussein setting light the oil fields, that there would be a uh, it would devastate the climate. And uh, in, in, in uh, February 1994, ABC's Nightline gave airtime to Al, Al Gore and his allegations of who was funding climate skeptics and no doubt cooler heads if cooler heads were the cooler heads coalition. And before reminding um, viewers that Carl Sagan had made this prediction, Fred, on the other hand, had said if there was any smoke, it would... It would it, clear quickly and there wouldn't be a there wouldn't be a climactic disaster as as Carl Sagan had predicted. Ted Koppel then told viewers the record shows that in this instance Dr. Sagan was wrong and Dr. Singer was right before going on to accuse Al Gore of quote resorting to political means 
to achieve what should ultimately be resolved on a scientific basis. And that, as we know, is how, the, how science has been perverted in the cause of a political project. Which brings me to the most, in, the most important science of all in a place like this. It's what uh, Peter Gay, the, historian of the, the great historian of the Enlightenment, calls the science of freedom. And he writes about the enlightened despots of the 18th century who believed they knew better than the people they governed, how, how people should be governed. De Govan Gay writes, the, the ruler must have at his disposal a perfectly obedient bu bureaucracy, all the knowledge it is possible for him to gather and unlimited authority to translate his programs into law. That again is a description of the Obama EPA, the whole approach to climate change policy. But this is a form of government that you Americans rejected in 1776 in favor of the truths embodied in the greatest document of the Age of Enlightenment, the Declaration of Independence. But America's uniqueness lies not in the fact of its independence, that it, but that it became independent to preserve and safeguard and maintain the principle of liberty. And what I suggest to you is that the demands of the climate industrial complex are, are completely incompatible with the preservation of liberty. The science is settled, we're told. The government must act. But global warming demands more than just government action. It demands that citizens agree. And it requires of those who don't agree to hold their tongue and that dissent be silenced. Thus, global warming harbors a strong impulse to the, toward the governing modes of the, of the absolutist, of the enlightened despot, and the political culture of the totalitarians. And it's for that reason that what is at stake is what makes America unique. Because ultimately, global warming is a battle for America's soul. And that's, after all, why we're all here today. And that's why we're here to fight it. Thank you.